welcome to Passion Time. We're here with author Peggy Ornstein. She is the New York Times bestseller author of Cinderella Out at My Aid My Child, right? Aid My Daughter. Aid My Daughter, uh, because she does have a young daughter. Today we're going to talk about girls and sex. Uh, this is her latest book. Um, and we're going to focus on how to talk to your children about sex because there's there's so much stuff going on that these kids don't know about and really parents need to be more proactive about this right Peggy yes our first question is how are you living your passion how did you find your passion and how you're living your passion so I'm always, I've always been passionate about writing and I decided to become a journalist when I was 14 years old Wow! and I was in ninth grade, uh, tenth grade, excuse me, tenth grade and I took a, just by chance took a journalism class for the first quarter of my tenth grade year and we were assigned to go write a piece that they call a sights and sounds piece mm -hmm. where you um, go and look at a scene and you write everything that you see and everything that you hear and you make a story about it and I chose to go to my local um, ski stores tent sale, I grew up in Minneapolis so every year they had a tent sale and I saw this mother and daughter I'll never forget this I saw this mother and daughter arguing about ski jackets right, right. you know how much to spend how short it was right. and I just wrote this whole thing and I made it into a, a, a story that was about the relationship between this mother and daughter and something it was like being hit by lightning I mean I just thought this is it and I have never wanted to do anything else you know, in Other than for the last 40 years, that's all I wanted to do. Well, you're doing it very well, so Thank I'm glad you. you're, you're living your passion. Um, I, I, I really loved your book. Thank you. Um, it, it upset me, actually, mm. uh, because I think sex is such a wonderful thing and it shouldn't be so traumatic. Mm. Um, but I, I think I want to focus, definitely want to focus on how parents can teach their children about sex. And we'll go over some, some of the issues that happen in America when it comes to sexual education. Abstinence. Hasn't worked, right? Has it? No, abstinence, abstinence only education, which I fear we may be going back to now, has been a complete disaster. We've spent $1.7 billion that we might as well have set on fire because what we know after decades of research is that abstinence only education doesn't work that um, young people may delay intercourse for a few months be, uh, if they go through those programs, but just a few months. And meanwhile, they're six times more likely to have oral sex. The boys are four times more likely to engage in anal sex. And the pregnancy rates are exponentially higher, higher as are the disease rates. So it's not working and we're still doing it because it's- Ideology. It, it makes it, yeah, a religion with, with sex. But yeah. let's talk about, you, you, you so they're not getting it in school. They're not you cannot think that not. your kids, and, and there's a way that we think that we're protecting our children by not talking to them about sex, but they are exposed to images, sexualized images, from the time they're very little. And the average age now of exposure to pornography, to online pornography, which is something that's huge a problem. huge game changer, yeah. um, is 11. 11. So these kids are getting the education from porn or the internet or but not and or the school but not from the right. parents. So there's a way that it's almost like cheesecloth and we think that we're protecting kids by not telling them anything but all the creepy stuff just goes right through the cheesecloth no, into their brains. And and it's the the pornography thing. Wait. You know your child looks at pornography intentionally or whether somebody in sixth grade holds up their smartphone and goes, look, you know, the average age of exposure is about 11 years old now. Too young. And so we need to, you know, no matter how you feel about pornography, there was a, there was a, a piece of research from the United Kingdom that uh, polled college students and they found that 60% of them said that they viewed pornography in part as sex education even though 75% said they knew it was about as realistic as pro wrestling, right? Yeah, it's not even close. Right, so, so this is another area. It's not where we want our kids to be learning about sex. No. It's another area where you know, female sexuality is a performance for men, where bodies are distorted, both female and male bodies, where humiliation and degradation of women is often eroticized, relationships are non-existent. And when kids are exposed to that repeatedly, before they've even held hands or had a first kiss, I think we have to agree, regardless of how you feel about whether porn is good or bad or, or right. censorship or whatever, that is a problem in our culture right now. And it's one that honestly, I think as parents, I think it just came up, we just weren't prepared. It came out of left field because we didn't grow up with the right, internet. Right, exactly. We didn't grow up with the internet. We, and, and, I, and I also want to say for parents who are imagining right now 
like a Playboy centerfold or something, they need to go to one of the popular uh, porn websites and look at what you can see for free and what kids are exposed to because it's really, really scary. different. Scary. Um, let's talk about Holland. I'm so glad that you did your research outside of the U.S. Yeah. because we tend to be very ethnocentric when it comes to these things. And this is a very conservative country somewhat. Um, in Holland, the parents apparently play a much more proactive role in teaching their kids about sexuality. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the kids tend to have better sexual relationships, they do. better partnerships, better everything. So tell us what they do differently than we do. So I was looking at some research that compared the early sexual experience of 300 randomly chosen girls from two similar, dem similarly de uh, demographically similar uh, American and Dutch colleges. Mm -hmm. And yes, the Dutch girls, everything we say we want. Fewer pregnancies, less disease, less regret, more uh, likely to be able to communicate with their partner. They knew their partners better. They prepared responsibly. They enjoyed themselves. And the big secret, the big difference, was that the Dutch girls said that their doctors, teachers, and parents, so it was a really like It a, wasn't just the parents. It wasn't it was just the parents. Teachers. It was a holistic thing. Right. Talk to them frankly and candidly about, from sex. an early age, about sex, about pleasure, and about the importance of mutual trust. And the thing that really affected me as a parent was that they said that American parents weren't necessarily less comfortable talking to their kids about sex, but that we framed those conversations exclusively in terms of risk and danger. Right, we look at it negatively. Yes, right? and the Dutch talk about balancing responsibility Beautiful. and joy. Right. And I'll tell you, I'm an American parent. Right. I grew up in the United States. Right. And I read that and it was like a bolt from the blue because I felt, I know, I know that I would talk to my daughter about contraception, about disease protection, and because I'm very modern, about consent. And I would have thought, okay, I've got all the bases covered. Go to, you know, and now I know that that is not, not enough. Not enough. Not right, enough. Right. Tell me about Kara Dennison. Why did you interview her, and, and mm. what do you like about her program? So Kara Dennison is an educator in Northern California, and I shadowed her for about a year talking wow, to that kids. Long. Yeah. Wow. Um, and. What I loved about her was that she said that her whole job, she didn't like being called a sex educator. Mm -hmm. She said her whole job was to teach kids or help kids to make as many decisions as possible that ended in honor and joy rather than shame and regret. I love it. I know. And I it love was, it. she said she really intentionally used that language because she didn't want to say good choices and bad choices, healthy no. choices and unhealthy choices, because that can be different for different people. Yes. And yeah. some of the kids that she talked to came from families that were telling their children to remain abstinent until right. marriage. Very and some of the kids, you know, were hooking up every weekend. And yeah. she wanted something that fit them all. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about her class, I mean, a lot of it wasn't about sex a lot of it was about communication and treating people well and you know all of these things that we know about every it's not separating no it's the not sex separated from the person, it's right? integrated and right. but she also um, you know encouraged the kids and I loved it was co-ed so they were the kids were working these issues through together and one of my favorite moments was when one of the boys raised his hand and he said you know that baseball metaphor? Do you know that baseball? You know mm -hmm. the, oh, so Americans all grow up learning right. to run the, that baseball metaphor. You run the bases. Oh, yeah, first base, second yeah, base. Yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. Yes. So um, that baseball metaphor for sex, he said, you know, in baseball, there's winners and there's losers. So who's the loser supposed to be in sex? And I felt like that was so profound because I felt like at that moment, that boy was making this shift in his head. And that he was going to go into his relationships, whether they were, you know, one-off hookups or relationships that were going to last 20 years, right. more as a partner and less as an adversary, and less in not so much seeing, which this baseball metaphor promotes, the idea that girls' limits are something that boys are supposed to get over. Right. Now, I want I want to ask you about how you teach your daughter and how what advice you would give parents, knowing what you know now. Um, one thing I noticed, though, even in your book about hookup culture and about rape. Mm. Unfortunately, in most cases, there's alcohol involved. Yep. So in many obviously, cases. in many mm -hmm. cases, obviously, I'm thinking that they're doing this because they don't feel comfortable yep. facing the reality of sex. Well, so young particularly if it's it. a hookup situation, right? You don't um, know the person very well, and what the girls would say is that it would be awkward. To, you know. Yeah. And and. Yeah, my feeling would be like, live with the awkward. The awkward is trying to tell you something. Um, but it's again this idea that girls are told now that they are free to engage. 
in sexual relationships, but not necessarily free to enjoy them or free to have control over them or free to direct them towards what works for what them. What they really want. Yeah, whether, right? that's, whether that's physical satisfaction or emotional connection. Right. Or both, ideally. So knowing what you know, what advice do you give parents as far as good sex education? On what age should they start teaching their uh, kids? So the age issue is important. <laughs> zero. Would be really? the age. That well, early. because I think not. You know, it's not that you suddenly tell yeah. them, "Hey." <laughs> <laughs> No, but you tell you start by naming all the body parts by right. saying, Important. "Here's your vulva." Here's or, or you and know, say it. Anybody, clitoris. yeah, anybody who has a preschooler knows that they have a tendency to masturbate. Yes. Publicly. Oh, and, that, oh okay. Right. And I mean, yeah, like you know, true. wherever. That's true. Yeah. Right. So you can say, you know, it feels really good yeah. to touch your vulva or touch your penis, um, but we don't do it at the Thanksgiving table at Grandma's house. That's something that we do privately. So you know, supporting <laughs> supporting it by you but know, also, private. also making it clear and and things like consent issues are really actually very easy to teach in a developmental way because they go with everything else with friendship you know if somebody doesn't want to be hugged you don't hug exactly you if expect. somebody doesn't want to play if somebody says no you stop if you say no they need to stop those are very easy lessons that we teach kids all the time that segue into these other lessons. And then, you know, as kids get older, there's a lot of, um, there's books for kids. I mean, I always recommend, I can give you some great recommendations of yes. books right yes. now. Yes, um, for kids themselves, the Roby Harris books, like It's Not the Stork, um, That's So Amazing, and It's Perfectly Natural, for, oh, well, Perfectly Normal. Okay. Um, they're for different age groups, okay, but okay. you pick the right one. They're fantastic for kids themselves. Okay. For adults, I would like to recommend um, from diapers to dating for, for people with smaller children. That takes you from about zero to 12. Okay. And it's great because it does this really, it's also great for anybody interested in developmental psychology because it okay. talks about what kids are really asking when they ask you questions, what they're asking when they say, where did I come from? Because it might not be what you think. Mm -hmm. um, and it really gets great direction around those sorts of things. And then Deborah Rothman's book, Talk to Me First, is outstanding. Talk to Me First, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And Al Vernacchio's book, For Goodness Sex. And then for teenagers, and college students, my present to them is Heather Karina's book, which is called SEX. And then I always forget the subtitle, but it's something like a progressive all you need to know guide, guide to getting right. you through high school and college or something. And then she has a website called Scarlet Teen. Scarlet Teen, okay. Yeah, that's also outstanding. And right. those will give you tools and examples of conversations that are, because of course it's not going to be, you can't have the same conversation with a four year old no. as a 14 year old. So for me to tell you this is what you say, I can't do that. No, you no. need a they need to read and they need You to need to talk. know. Just like you know about you know, you really think and you really know about how to talk to your child about, you know, bullying or schoolwork right. or right. friendships. We read a lot of parenting books, but we don't read this one. All right, Peggy Arstein, thank you for the work that you do. My the pleasure. name of the book is Girls and Sex and I recommend it highly, especially to parents with young young people. All right, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Passion Time.